Welcome to Timeless Truth with Pastor Jim Thomas, a resource of the Village Chapel in Nashville, Tennessee. This week we're finishing up our current season and we'll return after the Christmas holiday to continue our study of the Gospel of Mark. Also, don't forget that on Monday, December 4th, we'll begin the first season of our new podcast, Creative Thinking with Kim Thomas. You can subscribe today in your favorite podcast app. But now, this week, as we continue the Gospel of Mark, here's Pastor Jim. All right, here's a chapter that's going to make you think. Might even raise a few questions from a few of you. And if you have some, send them in. I'm happy to add them to the questions I have, okay? Um, We're going to look at the first 21 verses of Mark chapter 8, where we will see something of the compassion of Jesus. We'll see several questions of Jesus. And then we'll see a caution from Jesus. So take a look with me, if you will, or listen, if you happen to be busy. Uh, Listen to chapter 8, verses 1 through 21 of Mark's gospel. In those days, again, that again is important because this is going to sound familiar to you. In those days, again, when there was a great multitude and they had nothing to eat, he, Jesus, summoned his disciples and said to them, I feel compassion for the multitude because they have remained with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away fasting to their home, they will faint on the way, and some of them have come from quite a distance. Well, his disciples answered him, What will anyone be able to find enough, or where will anyone be able to find enough to satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? And Jesus was asking them, how many loaves do you have? Now that, I would have thought that would have kind of sounded familiar to them as a question from Jesus. I mean, given what we studied and we looked at chapter six, for instance, um, which to those of us who are studying Mark's gospel, it seems like it was just a few days ago. Um, for these guys, it might've been a little bit longer than that, but nonetheless, Uh, When Jesus asked them that same question and then they came up with five loaves and two fish and they, he blessed it, broke it, and uh, they distributed five loaves and two fish and literally fed five, 10, maybe 15,000 people with it. They should remember that. And so here Jesus goes uh, after he's expressed his compassion and they've said, where in the world are we going to get enough bread to satisfy all of these people here in this wilderness area. And he, he says, well, how many loaves do you have? And I just, I just, I, I think there should have been a ding, 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 lights going on on top of all their heads. But no, they answer him the question he asked. They say seven. Okay, so they're still not quite dialed in. He directed the multitude to sit on the ground and uh, taking these seven loaves, He gave thanks and broke them and began giving them to his disciples to serve to them. And they served them to the multitude. They also had a few small fish. And after he had blessed them, he ordered these to be served as well. And so the disciples now again are, you know, going around to these various groups that have been seated on the hillside or the countryside there. And once again, they find themselves being servers in this uh, outdoor uh, al fresco uh, restaurant that Jesus has put together for this multitude of people, this large group of people. And this time he's got seven loaves. That's more than last time he had five loaves before. And a few, we don't know how many, small fish, which he's done the same thing to this food that he did to the other food. He blessed it, he broke it, and then he began asking the disciples to distribute it. And they indeed have done that. And you would think as they're handing it out, you would think that the light would go on, but evidently not. They ate, the crowd did, and they were satisfied. And they picked up seven large baskets full of what was left over of the broken pieces. You'll remember with the feeding of the five, ten, or 15,000, they picked up 12 baskets full. And that was a different kind of basket. Uh, these are large baskets, uh, the kind of basket that the Apostle Paul might have been set in when he was dropped down over the city wall and uh, it, it sort of enabled him to escape from a, a mob that was coming after him. So this was not just a lunch pail. This isn't just a you know King David lunch 
icebox or something like this is actually a pretty large basket. And so there are, uh, when they take everything up, there's seven large baskets full of what was left over of the broken pieces. And about 4,000 were there and he sent them away, Jesus did. And immediately there is the 30th of 40 uses of the word immediately by Mark in his gospel. He is a, he's truly a fast paced, um, you know, uh, it, it's it's fast, it's like an action, you know, this scene to that scene to this scene to that scene. Immediately, Jesus entered the boat with his disciples and came to the district of Dalmanutha. Now, it's fascinating again to me that there hasn't already been a conversation while they're in this boat on the way to Dalmanutha. Where is Dalmanutha? We don't know. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff in the Bible that's, you know, a, a record of, of thousands of years of history. So we ought to expect that occasionally we're going to run across something we don't know. But there's a whole lot, of course, that we can sort of triangulate and cross-reference, even with extra biblical uh, resources that we have available to us. But Dalmanutha is one of those that's re- that remains a mystery as far as I can tell. There are some folks that sort of equate it to Magdala, this... Uh, uh, area, I think on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. And so when they came to the district of Dalmanutha, perhaps Magdala was one of the villages in that district. Well, that's not what's important, but what's important is verse 11. The Pharisees came out and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And so Mark gives us an insight into their motives, the religious leaders, Their motives were they wanted to argue with him. They came after, they're aggressive, they're coming after him. They're seeking from him a sign. They're demanding a sign is what's happening. As if he hasn't given them any already. He's been healing people by the hundreds and thousands. He's done public uh, miracles like feeding the five, 10, 15,000. And all of these uh, healings and the, the, the people that are, Uh, riddled with leprosy who have presented themselves in the temple uh, to be declared clean. So there's all of that evidence. And these guys are asking for yet more evidence. One more sign. Verse 12 tells us that even Jesus is kind of getting a little bit tired of their demands and their questions and their um, uh, having eyes that cannot see and ears that cannot hear. It says, and sighing deeply in his spirit, He said, why does this generation seek for a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. And the term this generation may indeed be a reference to the religious leadership of that time. Uh, Not all of the religious leaders of that time uh, are naysayers against Jesus. As a matter of fact, we know that Nicodemus, we know that Joseph of Arimathea, uh, are, are guys that are going to uh, become solid believers and they'll even uh, be the two guys that will carry Jesus' body from the cross to the tomb that uh, Joseph of Arimathea owned. And he was, uh, he was on the Sanhedrin. He was, he was one of the main, you know, main leaders uh, on the ground during that time. So, but for the most part, the religious leaders represented here by these Pharisees in this particular instance, they're, they're looking for an argument. They're demanding another sign. And Jesus sighing deeply. And, you know, I don't know if you're a sire, but sometimes it really does help to sigh. My mom is a sire. She's just ah, like that. And sometimes there's a little click right before it hurts. She goes ah, like that. And sometimes it feels like the click, you know, introduces uh, the sigh and helps complete the whole experience. But it's sometimes just cathartic. It's it's therapeutic in a way to sigh a little and just relieve, you know, just let a little bit of breath out. And Jesus goes on and adds to the sigh. He says it out loud, evidently. Why does this generation seek for a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. Well, leaving them, verse 13 says, he again embarked and went away to the other side. So here he is. He's going back and forth across the Sea of Galilee and his disciples uh, are with him, but leaving these religious leaders, um, he and the disciples get in the boat and they, the disciples, have forgotten to take bread and did not have more than one loaf in the boat with them. And he was giving them orders uh, saying this, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And leaven is what made, when you're baking bread, uh, leaven is what made bread rise. It's kind of, you know, made it kind of fluffy. I, I love, boy, I'll tell you what, I love 
freshly baked bread. Maybe you do too. I mean, and I, I almost don't care what kind it is. Sourdough, uh, pumpernickel, um, uh, whole wheat, whole grain. I mean, I'll, I'll uh, cranberry nut. Wal cranberry walnut bread. Oh my goodness. I'm not getting a kickback for this, but the Costco cranberry walnut bread is amazing. And I love fresh baked bread. Jesus is saying here to his disciples as they're wondering, oh, uh oh, what, we didn't bring any bread with us. And here we are on the boat. And he was saying, watch out. Don't depend on the leaven of the Pharisees or the leaven of Herod. And Herod represented the, really the Roman government. So don't don't depend on the leaven of the religious leaders, or let's say, don't depend on the leaven of rule following and religious ritualistic uh, repetition, kind of meaningless uh, routines, right? Don't depend on that. Don't depend on the political uh, power of Herod. And they began to discuss with one another the fact that they had no bread. 16, they're fixating, verse 16 says, they're fixating on the fact that they don't have any bread with them in front of the guy who just took seven loaves and fed 4,000. And if that was just men, maybe that was 8,000 or 12,000. And before that, they had been with the same guy when he fed all of the five, 10, 15,000 people was with the five loaves and two fish. And they're in a boat. They're in a little boat. They can see each other. They're within, they can reach each other. They can touch each other. And this is the guy who walked on water. This is the guy that cr literally created bread and fish as he kept breaking it and giving it to them to distribute. And they're complaining, they're worried in their little boat with the Son of God and with Messiah. They're worried that they're not going to make it uh, because they forgot to bring some bread with them. Well, Jesus is aware of this, verse 17. Here comes his, his caution. We've seen his compassion. Now we're going to, we've heard one or two of his questions, but we're going to hear a few in a row here. And, and this will be uh, a word of caution to them, if you will. Um, listen to the questions. I think these are really important. Jesus is aware of their uh, discussion because they're in the same boat and it's not that big. Why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many baskets full of broken pieces you picked up? And they said to him, 12, 12. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? And they said to him, uh, seven. It's, it's almost like, they just his asking questions uh, puts them in a position where they're going, uh oh, we should know this. Uh oh, we didn't do something right. And he's trying to get them to think. And he's doing it by asking them questions. And I, I think he does that for me so often as well. As a matter of fact, I'm going to encourage you to go back and read this entire passage again on your own and answer each of those questions. If you know, try to put yourself in the position of the disciples and, and think back yourself on those times when Jesus has, pro has proved himself faithful to you. And when he says something like, why are you talking about this? Why are you worried about this? And then I love that question at the end of verse 18, rolling into verse 19. Do you not remember? See, my, my faith memory is kind of short as well. And I, so I think he's really, he's doing us all a good favor, I think, to remind us of these questions. And so verse 21, and I'll close with this, or in terms of reading it anyway, he was saying to them, do you not yet understand? And the yet's important there. In other words, with all you've seen, with, with all you've heard me say, with all you've seen me do, with all of that, do you not yet understand? How, how much more evidence do we need? How much more reassurance do we need? All of that is so important. And I think this text is, it, since it begins with the compassion of Jesus, I think we got to start there. That even in asking these questions, even in the act that Jesus takes to feed those 4,000 or 10,000 or 8,000, whatever it is, um, his, he's being moved by compassion. And that, that, that's a key right there. I think we need to know what kind of heart Jesus has 
when he's in the presence of people who are needy, not only for physical food, but for spiritual understanding. And I'm one of those. And so are you, I'm sure. Compassion, it's love that's on the move and especially perfected in the person of Jesus. It's love that must take action. Jesus moved to his core when he sees the people, the, the, the multitudes. To him, they appear to be sheep who have no shepherd and they have great need and they're vulnerable. And he wants to be the good shepherd. He wants to be the bread of life for them. He wants to protect and provide for them, just like he does for you and like he does for me. He who sang so often the same song we have sung, the psalm we have sung, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And that last phrase is the same thing you could say it another way. The Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. I won't be in want. I'm not in some kind of need that will never go met. No, if the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. The compassion of Jesus was the kind of love that was paying attention, was aware, and he saw the need of that multitude and he simply had to take action to meet that need. John Stott has a book, uh, Christian Mission in the Modern World, and this quote is from it. We are sent into the world like Jesus to serve, for this is the natural expression of our love for our neighbors. We love, we go, we serve. So if we're going to uh, embark upon the uh, adventurous life of following Jesus, We'll start to see the multitudes. We'll start to see others the way Jesus sees them. And we too will be moved with compassion. We too will want to meet the needs. Uh, C.H. Spurgeon, the 19th century uh, minister from over in London, he was called the Prince of Preachers. And um, you, you can imagine that uh, in that day and time, there's in, in a big city like that, tons and tons of need, physical need as well as spiritual need. And he uh, is the one that's credited with this uh, quote, if you give a man the gospel, wrap it in a sandwich. And if you give a man a sandwich, wrap it in the gospel. And I love that. I think that's really wonderful, especially when you think about all those who are hungry, all those who are poor, all those who are needy. Um, let's meet their real physical needs as well as give them the gospel, which is their eternal need, their deepest need, if you will. So we see the compassion of Jesus. We also see the questions of Jesus here. And remember, all of the questions of Jesus were designed to get others to think or to consider something or to see something they had missed or something that they just weren't seeing in the moment. And so he asks these questions. And I love that Jesus taught by asking questions. Sometimes I'm just not that bright. Sometimes I just need to be asked a question so that I'll consider and think for a moment. Remember Socrates is the one that said the unexamined life wouldn't be worth living. Um, and he, he, you know, he lived a long time before Jesus, but that's the truth of Jesus because Jesus actually, uh, before he came to this planet, um, he was one with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit all the way back to the creation event. So all truth belongs to Jesus. Uh, he even declared himself to be the way, the truth, and the life. And so we trust him in all of that. But here's the disciples. And here they are sort of dull in a way, and Jesus begins to ask them some questions. Jesus also asked a lot of the religious leadership who were at odds with him, some of them belligerent, willful unbelievers, some of them perhaps uh, considering as he would talk to them, pondering, uh, deeply thinking about the questions that he would ask them. Peter Kreef says, dullness no doubt is the strongest enemy of faith, just as indifference, not hate, is the strongest enemy of love. Let me read that again. I think that's worth pondering. Dullness, not doubt, is the strongest enemy of faith. Dullness. Remember, Jesus is talking about people having a, a hardness of heart. Is your heart that hard? Are you looking, you just can't see? Are you, are you listening and you just can't hear? And then Jesus would often say, if you've got ears to hear or eyes to see, this will be revealed to you. And so it's so important, I think, that we ask ourselves, are we just dull? Are we just indifferent to what the Lord would say to us, reveal to us? 
Tim Keller, the Bible has answers, but if we really let the Bible speak, we may find that God will show us that we are not even asking the right questions. And that so often is true as well. Sometimes we think we are so smart and uh, and some of these guys that want to try to catch Jesus in some way to discredit him, these Pharisees that come along and some of these other religious leaders that will come along and try to uh, catch Jesus in some kind of a conundrum. And he, he bests them every single time and helps us all, uh, reading this so many years later, to be able to see what the really important questions are. And I believe Mark's gospel is presenting us with those two big questions. Who is Jesus? And how should we respond to Jesus? And that's really good. This passage helps me, and I hope it helps you as well, to consider our own hearts. Are we, have we gotten, gone dull? Uh, Have we forgotten uh, so many of the wonderful things that God has done in our life in the past, how he's proven himself faithful? Do we just not remember? I think these are really good questions. Um, you may have questions as well. Some of them could be of the intellectual nature. Some of them could be uh, simply uh, you're curious about the way this all fits together. And there's so many great resources. I want to recommend that you visit thevillagechapel.com slash resources. We have a, a, a lot of book recommendations up there and I want to encourage you to go and check those out. There is a place for questions, Kevin DeYoung once said. There is a time for conversations. But there's also the possibility of certainty, not because we have dissected God like a freshman biology student dissects a frog, but because God has spoken to us clearly and intelligibly and has given us ears to hear his voice. Are you listening? I hope you are today. And whatever you put your hand to, wherever you go, whatever you do, continue to be listening for the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this passage. Um, I pray for each and every one of us that will be sharpened to hear you today, to be listening for you today, to be watching for your guidance, for your wisdom, uh, for your leading, for the people that you have us encounter, Lord, that we might uh, allow the gospel to fall freely from our lips and be visible in our deeds. We pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. Thanks for listening to today's study. Take a moment to leave a review and share this episode with friends and family. You can stay connected by signing up for our newsletter or follow us on social media. At The Village Chapel, we believe God's Word is unique in its source, timeless in its truth, broad in its reach, and transforming in its power. For more resources or to support our ministry, visit our website, thevillagechapel.com.